I don't know about you, but I'm predicting a lot of exciting, amazing things that happen to the group. Like big, big, like big, like not just big, but big time stuff. I'm telling you, bro, what's been happening, bro? Uh, not too much. Still okay. hitting more Peggy on. Everybody, welcome back to Riff Raff. Shane Terrio here. Thanks for tuning in. How is everybody? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for asking. Um, yeah, it's been a while, but um, everything's been good. Hope everybody's staying healthy during these crazy, crazy times. Couple of announcements. Uh, a little shameless self-promotion, but it is my podcast, so. I'm launching a new website, completely revamped. I'm really excited about this, shaneterrio.com. Yeah, really original, I know, but hey, it's easy to find, and you'll love it. I mean, I've got a lot of new instructional things up there, a lot of music. I've been spending a lot of time posting new things, and I will continue to do so. Um, I encourage you to go check it out, sign up mailing list uh there's gonna be a lot of exclusive content a lot of new music i've been writing that's not available anywhere else um uh, also i've been hit you know a lot of people have hit me up about doing lessons um i'm gonna do one called mojo mondays and we're gonna it's gonna be a live master class workshop you know i'll talk about all, all things guitar and um there's gonna be a lot of things up there that aren't i'm not putting on youtube or anything else so check it out I want to give a shout out to Elizabeth Dunn and Rex Singleton. Uh, thank you so much for the donations for Riff Rap. I appreciate your help and support. It means the world to me. Um, and anyway, thanks all you guys for listening. Happy holidays. Check me out Instagram, Facebook, and um, take care. Here's today's guest. My guest today is Mr. Guthrie Trapp. Guthrie's a phenomenal guitar player, impeccable tone, taste, technique. And uh, as, you're, as you hear now, it's a tune called Pick Piece from his record of the same name, Pick Piece. Urge you to check that out. I'm sure you've probably heard of Guthrie if you're checking out this podcast, but if not, you're about to become a fan by the end of it, maybe halfway through. Yeah, Guthrie's probably known for playing with Jerry Douglas early on. That was... Uh, probably the first gig where he got to showcase his abilities you know he's one of the best guitar players not just in Nashville but basically anywhere and um, great guy always great to see him this episode is really fun I mean we really uh, it really kind of went instructional for a while so you'll probably get a lot out of it a lot of licks how many licks does it take to get to the end of this podcast well the world may never know but you may steal a few before the end of it. Guthrie's also a very successful teacher. You can check him out on artistworks.com. We talk about that as well. And it was great to have him on. Hope you enjoy it.
eyes. <laughs> At the Twilight Zone corner. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I'm always in the twilight zone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Spy cord. I love that. <laughs> Tonight on the twilight zone. Oh. Yeah, Guthrie. Oh, man. Killing. I'm here with my bro, uh, Guthrie Trap. I'm, I'm here taking a guitar lesson. <laughs> Shit, yeah, right. Shit. Oh, my this, God. I'm going to have to get... Um, the the lady that cleans our house to come up and sweep the floor after all those notes yeah, on the floor, right. all our notes. We uh, oh. well, I'm suffering from deadly note buildup. Well, that's I early been gigging. Yeah, so, yeah. You know, I'm getting scraping it off like plaque. Right, right. <laughs> I I totally understand that. It's just it's nice to sit and and play guitar with somebody, man. It's been know, a while. Man. Are you comfortable? Because I don't want you to have to lean. You want me to get you another chair? You no, good? no, no. I'm I good. I'm, I'm gonna scoot mic. up a little bit. Yes, I'm up. good. So Guthrie's just hanging in uh, New Orleans for a week, and we uh, a couple of mutual friends and our went, we went to dinner last night. And yeah, man, why not take advantage of you being in town to be a guest? Thanks for coming by. Absolutely, man. Thanks for having me. Guthrie sounds fine through that Vibra Lux, and well, you would have sounded fine through my pig nose. Super nice, man. That's a lush. Yeah, I love warm. that. Warm. Yeah. yeah, that's a great sounding guitar too, man. I can't believe I'm playing a guitar that that. Uh, belonged to john schofield and yeah. now it's yours he gave it to you yeah it was a birthday gift a birthday gift really cool i know it, it's so it's an artist an ibanez artist uh his his artist model which is a i use it all the time now man i take that and a strat or a tele session done it's beautiful guitar that thing sounds killer for rhythm it's, it stays in tune i just use it on this girl's record this week so the strings are a little funky on it but you sound it great feels on. good yeah yeah it tunes up like a piano man it's a great guitar it All really right. does sound great yeah man I, I, you know i i got called to do this clinic in south africa and so i arranged for my mom and dad to be able to go i'm an only child so i arranged for my mom and dad to be able to go with me and we went over there for like three week three weeks right at the beginning of march and so that was right when all this stuff started happening. And then so we got back safely and everything, which was a, a kind of a, you know, a little bit of a stressful ordeal, but not too bad. We ended up lucking out. But when we got back to Nashville, of course, I did the 14 day quarantine and then started, you know, just seeing how everything was going and obviously no live music or anything like that. And so after, you know, kind of hanging out for four or five months, you know, a couple of weeks ago, we said, well, look, let's meet in the mountains over in the Smokies. We'll do a week just to get out of town. I just needed to change the pace. Yeah. And so change the scenery. So we went over there and then went to Asheville with our buddy Peyton, who you met last night. And then, um, and then we drove down to new Orleans and I'm just here kind of indefinitely, you know, yeah. hanging and, and, you know, doing this with you, which is awesome. And then yeah, just Kevin's seeing gone. what happens, you know, I mean, after being in Nashville for almost 20 years, it's kind of, it's kind of time for a little, uh, change the scenery a little you know it's good to mix it up a yeah bit, yeah a little know? inspiration things from being a little uh what do you, what's the word I'm, I'm thinking of incestuous yes i yeah. mean i think it's good to mix things up musically i'm about to do the same thing myself actually so yeah we have a mutual friend doug below but i, I think we maybe met before then i don't remember but yeah have many mutual friends and one mutual boss right John Oates. that's right yeah yeah. What a crazy! You were talking about him last night. He's a really great guy, and uh, one of my favorites of all time, man. Yeah, yeah. I consider you know myself super lucky to be able to work with with these people, and I've always just gone where the good music, the work, and the good people are. I never really had a plan on like you know a goal or a plan. I just knew to keep keep going where the good music is. If you're unhappy in a situation, get out and change it until until you're you know in the right great right groove right and then met Oates and tell you right with jerry douglas about 15 years ago and just mm -hmm. kind of hit it off i didn't really even know at that point who hollow notes were mm -hmm. i didn't grow up listening to that music or my you know my parents listened to a lot of um bluegrass and folk music and some some jazz but nothing like i know uh, about th those players now like we didn't i didn't grow up on west montgomery or anything mm -hmm. like that i didn't know who those names were until people started getting me hip to those and but, you know, so I wasn't really aware of any 80s pop music or, or hard rock or anything like that, you know. Right. And probably why I gravitate more to always, you know, usually playing, especially in a situation like this, with a clean tone. Yeah. And uh, and if I get on a gig, I use more overdrive and stuff, of course. But, you know, just I've always just kind of naturally gravitated towards a, 
like you know front pickup warmer tone and a lot of people know me for playing telecaster country music but it's really just guys like you and me and 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 um you know people that are kind of influenced by a lot of different kinds of music we just play the to the song you know if it's a country song we play country if it's a blues tune we play blues if it's yeah. something like we just did we go we go to the feeling of the yeah, music use your in- musical instinct yeah, yeah but to not you know to to keep from rambling on but meeting oats and um you know it's interesting because how that I worked know, out yeah. you know yeah and I've, I've played with him a few times too on his it's i guess he would call john stuff more sort of americana country mm-hmm. roots yeah. totally yeah uh-huh. it's funny man um our mutual friend doug below is a great drummer yeah he, uh he, it's kind of a funny story i should probably say but you know guthrie <laughs> when i first met guthrie he was playing with Jerry Douglas. Jerry Douglas is a world-renowned dobro player. He's a great guy, and Doug Belote was his drummer. It still is his drummer. But one of these funny stories, like you're saying you didn't know anything about Hall & mm-hmm. Doug went to Nashville to audition for Jerry Douglas. That's right? right, yeah. And I remember when he told me, he's like, I'm going up to Nashville to audition. I said, dude, that would be great if you got that gig, because in Nashville it would be sort of like the equivalent of the the you know having the cloud of playing with like Zappa or something in the bluegrass where right. you'd automatically be in with a lot of people instant street yeah. cred right yeah. so so Doug goes up to audition and he nails the audition he said it was at Jerry's house mm-hmm. I was then, there yeah oh you were there yeah yeah and then after Doug says uh, man you know you look a lot younger than than I would have thought you know in those <laughs> movies and stuff and Jerry's like well, movies what? what are you talking <laughs> yeah. about and he goes yeah I mean I saw you in Smoking the Bandit and stuff when I was a kid. He thought he was Jerry Reed. (laughs) (laughs) He didn't even know who Jerry Douglas was. Unbelievable. And Jerry just laughed at it, I guess, right? It was so funny because Jerry's got an unbelievable sense of humor. And so, I mean, he, yeah, he was just like doubled over laughing, you know, and just thought it was awesome. And of course, those guys, they love that kind of shit, you know? They love it. And so, uh, but Doug was in immediately. You know what's funny is he was Doug was playing a bunch with Jack Pearson up there, right. and so I, that's the first time I heard him play. And I thought, well, God, this is incredible, you know. And so the guy that was going to play with us when I first joined Jerry's band, we haven't even done a gig yet. We were still rehearsing and stuff, and and this guy uh, bailed at the last minute. He had something come up. Like I don't know if it was a family emergency or something, but he had to cancel the whole first leg of this tour. And so Jerry was trying to figure out who who to get. And 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 um, me and Todd Parks, the bass player, both kind of at the same time said, and I kind of stepped out, you know, a little out of my comfort zone because I just had just met Jerry not that long ago. And I and I, but I knew I was so my intuition was so strong at that point. I said, Jerry, I said, before you hire anybody else, please listen to this guy. Please check this guy out. And he did, mm. you know, it ended up working out perfect. Yeah. I just, know you know, cause normally I wouldn't have, uh, yeah. who, who am I to recommend somebody to somebody like Jerry, you know, but we, we just yeah. knew that it was going to be awesome. But that's great, man. Yeah. Going yeah. back to Oates, funny story. Guthrie was, uh, we're in new Orleans right now. Guthrie was here a year or two ago playing out, out somewhere out of new Orleans with John Oates and John calls me or texts me. He's like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I told this story last night. It's fucking great. He goes, man, friggin' Guthrie, like he didn't bring a guitar strap, you know. And like, I can't get anywhere because of Mardi Gras parades. Is there is there a way the runner can't get to any stores? Like, you have an extra guitar strap? And I I said, yeah, man, no problem. But it's, it's got a big Confederate flag on it, but you can have it. <laughs> I let Guthrie wear it out on stage. Oh my god, oh, that was great. But Funny as shit. Anyway. Let's talk about you. I'm sure, you you know, I know you've been on a bunch of podcasts and interviews and things, so I don't want to go into like every beginning thing, but you, when you first started playing, were you, you were inspired by, um, was it more country music or like, who was the first guitar players that, what, what one made you want to pick up the instrument originally? Cause I don't know this stuff actually. Well, uh, so to go back to the, to, I'm from the, the Gulf coast on the Florida, Alabama state line mm-hmm. about two and a half, three hours east of here. And my mom and dad are not musicians. You know, they're not musically gifted or talented or whatever you want to call it. But my dad's youngest brother was a self-taught musician and, and uh, he played and had a bunch of different instruments around his uh, place. And uh, I hung out with him like an older brother. Like I said, I'm an only child. So gravitated towards hanging out with him. Super cool guy. 
and um, and had you know had different groups of people that he played with, some bluegrass guys, some kind of blues and you know kind of mild rock and roll kind of stuff, and just um, that kind of thing. But 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 I was always around a lot of live music. All of my family's friends were musicians of mm-hmm. some sort down there, and um, and there was always good music playing. Never there was no I wasn't raised on any um, top forty radio. Not that there's anything wrong with that. But it was just more um, roots, American roots music. Uh, one of my uh, my dad's middle brother uh, was more into jazz, so I heard guys like um, Jean Luc Ponty and uh, you know um, a little bit of John Schofield when I was really young, but I didn't really understand it back then. And so you know I didn't get hip to that stuff until years and years later. Uh, but I I you know blues bluegrass uh really good songwriters like they they were huge uh, van morrison jackson brown bob dylan fans uh neil young all that kind of stuff but at the same time i was learning how to play the mandolin and acoustic guitar like flat picking stuff uh i was jamming on my uncle's electric guitar like a, a 335 uh style guitar i was playing along to records like johnny winter and the allman brothers mm-hmm. and leonard skinner so roots kind of southern rock st- roots southern stuff, rock yeah. blues stuff like that and then, then god's then, music then I, yeah and so then i really got into that stuff but uh and then you know i, I wasn't raised on any country music I, my yeah. family didn't listen to country music yeah. i mean it was more john prine and stuff like that than yeah. it was uh you know i didn't really listen to we, 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 they weren't listening to merle haggard or or Buck Owens or anything like that. I really didn't get hip to that stuff until I got to Nashville. Oh, wow. You know, and so uh, I joined this band down on the Gulf Coast. We we uh, joined up with this guy that writes a lot of original music. He was from New York, so he kind of got me turned on to, like, Cuban music and different things like that. And then, uh, oh, I forgot to mention, my. Uh, you know, I was also listening to a lot of David Lindley and Ry Cooter and stuff mm-hmm. like that as, as a kid. Cause my uncle had all those records. So kind of a diverse, you know, somewhat diverse, uh, album collection, but, um, but so, you know, then, uh, where was I going with that? Shit. What was I just talking about? Well, I was just asking about what made you pick up the guitar and, and then you're talking about a club you were playing with a guy who wrote original. Oh, so we, we had this original band down there. And, and so... Was that at the Floor Bama? That was at the Floor Bama. We played all the venues on the Gulf Coast in Pensacola and Mobile and all around the Gulf Coast. But I never learned any cover songs. That was the interesting thing. Like, the only cover, you know, cover songs I learned were, like, bluegrass standards. Mm-hmm. And so I mainly played with origi- a lot of original music. So I didn't learn... Like, most guitar players would probably learn some Beatles songs or some Led Zeppelin songs or something like that. I never did that. I don't know any of those songs at all. Uh, Partly because I think my family, their friends were all musicians and songwriters, but of that kind of vein that I was talking about. But, and so we had this band and, uh, you know, I was trying to figure out my gear and my guitars and all the things we do when we're a teenager, changing pickups and trying to find all these different sounds I was looking for. And, um, some for some reason gravitated towards the Telecaster. I don't know why 335 and Telecaster because I think of playing so much acoustic guitar back then. They were the most stable, solid instruments, no, le- the least amount of moving parts of any yeah. guitar. So I gravitated towards the Telecaster, and then Danny Gatton I got turned on to, and I thought, wow, this is amazing. This guy's c- combining all these different styles that I love into one solo. Sometimes, you know, I thought this is really cool. So I learned a bunch of stuff from him on some videos and stuff and kind of saw his way of explaining in a in kind of his hillbilly way, which he said himself of playing jazz, which is thinking of playing, you know, um, I don't know any theory. I didn't go to school or anything. But, you know, if, if you're playing an e, e dominant seven, you can play B minor ideas. You can right. play G major seven ideas, just simple little right. tr- um, superimposing things right. like that. And that kind of helped get out of the pentatonic box and start learning some different harmony and stuff, which you can tell when I play, I'm not, I'm, I don't know really anything about jazz or heavy fusion music, but I, I kind of have the flavor of it, you know, a little yeah, the bit. Chromaticism, but, yeah. But uh, stuff like that. And then, you know, so when, so, so playing all these gigs with that band on the Gulf Coast, when I got to Nashville and started playing with Don Kelly, I kind of had the country vocabulary a little bit together, but <clears> then really learned more of that stuff when I got to Nashville and got that gig with him and played for four years with him at Roberts on Broadway. Now, now Don Kelly, for those of you that don't know, and, and you could fill it in, but he, he was like, he was kind of like the, uh, 
what's the word I'm looking for? He's like the godfather of Broadway. Of of Broadway in Nashville. So like if you were in his band, he always had a reputation of having like badass hot young gun guitar players. Yeah, right? that was another yeah. kind of instant so street that was cred. Sort of call, yeah, street cred. Yeah, yeah. Sort of a calling card immediately. Mm, get to yeah, town. so guys like um uh Brent Mason started with Don. Oh, Johnny, Brent was with Don. Johnny Highland, uh, you know, JD and Di- these guys and and so I did it for four years after Johnny Highland, and that's where I really learned. But Don, the thing about Don is he's from Tyler, Texas. He would be an R&B and blues guy, you know, if he had his way. But he he just, you know, he realized that he could do his kind of amped up version of all these country standards and classics, and they were just funny shit to play, you know. What about Red Volkart? Was Red he in Volkart there too? was in yeah. his band. Yeah, I totally Red. forgot about yeah. Red. Yeah. Yeah, so there you go. That's a pretty good company. Really good company, man. And I was just, like I said, I didn't know what else to do. I moved to Nashville, and I had heard about Don Kelly because they played the their CD in the local music store in Pensacola, and I heard Johnny, and he was doing uh, these cool steel bands. And I said, man, who is that? And the guy goes, oh, we, we just got back from the NAMM show, and we heard this guy down at Roberts. And so... You know, five years later when I moved to Nashville, I just thought, well, I don't know anything. I guess I'm going to go to this bar called Roberts. And I stood in the doorway and drank beer for the first month and met the band. And they all knew me because I was there, you know, three, four nights every weekend. And I just told Don, I said, I said, hey, man, I just moved to town. If Johnny ever can't make the gig, I'd love to sub for you sometime. And he goes, oh, man, we don't ever we don't even let anybody sit in, you know, and Don's kind of a uh, kind of a gruff Mm -hmm. dude and uh, real to the point, you know, and and so finally, we ran into this mutual f- songwriter friend of mine, uh, a friend of ours on the sidewalk, and he goes, "Man, you ought to get this kid to sit in with you sometime." And Don, and then that was like my way to get oh, in. Oh, okay. So I went down and sat in with him on a real s- icy, snowy Sunday night. And Don loves the blues. I didn't even bring a Telecaster to that gig. I brought like a Guild hollow body, <laughs> and, uh, and even though I knew that was like a Telecaster heavy gig. But Don loved that because he's a blues guy at heart, you know. Uh, and so he just liked that I did something a little different, I think. And and uh, and anyway, that turned into a, that was like my launching pad okay. into Nashville, you know. All right. Yeah, I didn't know that. I mean, I knew you had worked with him, but. Uh, yeah, pretty fun, man. It's, so you've been in Nashville 20 years? Coming up on 20 years. Wow, yeah. Man. Yeah. I just turned 41 in February. So, you know, it's it's interesting like the stuff we were talking about last night about your health and just having to kind of tone yeah. it down a little bit from when you're in your twenties and thirties. Yeah. That's kind of hitting me right now, 41 years old. And like, I can't eat and drink what I want to be able to anymore for a little while or maybe forever. Another few weeks. Or... <laughs> and so, you know, it's funny when you, that, when you get to that age and, and that I've age, been, dude, been, like 40 years old, I've been teaching a lot and it, it's cool. It's cool though, to realize for the first time, like, okay, I think I actually have enough experience to be able to share some things uh-huh. with other people that might not be total bullshit. <laughs> Is know? that what you're doing? I mean, we can get into this later, but you're doing a lot of teaching now, right? Like you have a, a on. I know you have a pretty big online school or a, a lot of lessons you do. Yeah, it, it just came from um, from you know being presented with the opportunity to do it. I didn't search out or seek yeah. out to be a teacher at all. But people years ago started asking about learning some chicken picking stuff. Yeah. And these Belmont students were like, hey, man, you know, can you just show us how to go from the one to the four chord, even though they're in jazz guitar school? And it was the theory was confusing to them, you know. And so, um, uh, yeah, so I took on a couple students. And then as that developed and I started for some reason, I don't know why, but I got into doing the social media thing. Mm-hmm. And then years ago and then started my YouTube channel a couple a year or a year and a half ago and just started taking off. And I got uh, this company in California called Artist Works. Uh, pre- you know, they, you know, presented me with this opportunity to do a school with them. And uh, so we did the whole, full curriculum and everything. And, and I was I, I wasn't touring a whole lot at that point with. Uh, I never really, you know, never, I, I feel, consider myself lucky to never have to tour with a real commercial country band right. or record on those records even or anything. I just kind of always, <laughs> you know, it was just a little different path. <laughs> yeah. You know, I ended up in no, a different, a little different place. But yeah. so they saw that I was active on social media and they wanted somebody that could teach and that was a decent guitar player. But they also wanted somebody that was, that they knew was going to promote it, yeah. you know, because it is a business. And so. Started doing that, got better as a teacher, I think, and and I I learned as much as anybody else doing it, and and I I enjoyed doing it. Before the COVID thing happened, as we all know, I I had a really good situation because I was playing enough live gigs 
doing the stuff with Oates and Sean Camp and some different people that I work with in town. Uh, some some of my own stuff. Uh, Charles Wig Walker, this great old soul sure. singer out there. I used there. to work with him. Yeah. yeah. And great. one of my really good friends, like, so there's, I had a, just, you know, from that amount of time in Nashville, I had a really great uh, network of friends, different live gigs, a lot of musical diversity. I was happy doing, uh, staying in town, had the lesson thing going, uh, like you, you know, have, you know, got some uh, rental property that helps. And so I didn't have to play any gigs or any music that I didn't want to. Yeah. And so, uh, and mainly hang around people that I didn't want to be around. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> let's just say let's that's just get really real. what it's all about yeah <laughs> i don't want to get on it's the a, bus with right. a bunch of pissed off right, right. complaining musicians or a bunch get of on a session where everybody's yeah yeah bitter bitter yeah. bitter people but um but so i was in a good place you know and and the teaching was uh, was enough you know there was five or six good things going on to where i wasn't getting burned out on one thing mm-hmm. and so then when covid hit i was like oh well well what's going to happen now? You know, I, when I got back from Africa, I thought, I thought, Oh shit, the first phone call I'm going to get are my tenants saying that they can't afford to live here. And then everything's going to fall apart. I was, you know, catastrophic thinking. And I was like, Oh God, man, this is going to be awful. Well, none of that happened. You know, we, we worry about these things and, and 90% of the things we worry about never happen. So I was really lucky there. The artist works thing and the teaching stuff, got even better because everybody's home. Right. What a great, that's what I was going to say. What's perfect timing for you right now. And so uh, my house and everything in East Nashville was okay after the tornado. And so I went from being super paranoid about everything to actually having some survivor's guilt Yeah. because all my friends are even, this thing is the first, I think we mentioned this last night, but this COVID thing is the first time that, that in the music industry, everybody's, being affected no matter what level you're on it doesn't matter if you're britney spears or if you're uh, a guy in a van touring out of That's nashville true. everybody's affected everybody's and affected worldwide and worldwide it's unbelievable yeah. yeah when you think about it so i'm super fortunate to be able to it's up to today right now what is it noon up till today <laughs> well, everything's yeah, okay well and so i'm just grateful that everything's okay till right yeah. now and I, you know we could all get a phone call in the next well, that's a good know, way to think man you know I, I read this thing once that we should think of day tight compartments yeah just worry about today yeah you know yeah i totally it's never agree. worked for me but i try to think about yeah. it <laughs> it's like well okay but i have a i gotta get my wisdom teeth pulled at 4 30 so that's still in today yeah. so i have to worry and about if, that and if that doesn't work there's five bars within walking distance from your <laughs> from house here, hell, yeah there are <laughs> yeah absolutely oh man <laughs> Anyway, that's not to ramble on and on and no, on, but, no. but I'm definitely, I'm definitely fortunate. And, and that, that kind of thing just, you know, that happened, but a lot of young kids will message me and, and go, Hey, I'm a, I'm an aspiring session guitar player, or I'm, I want to move to Nashville and be a guitar player. What should I do? And sometimes if I'm in a good mood, I'll, I'll say, Hey man, <laughs> you're give mood. me a call. Let's talk <laughs> yeah. about it. I'll, I'll sit on the phone yeah. and talk to you for 30 minutes about it and give you my spiel. Right. But usually I tell them like, Hey man, this is what I did. You know, I, I, I knew that I didn't want to play. I, I, I think it's more important to sometimes know what you don't want to do than, than even knowing what you do want to do. Cause then you can eliminate all that shit. It's great. And kind of, kind of go with, with what you want to do. And don't, don't learn a bunch of music that you don't like, learn what you like 
And if you're if you're going to gravitate and be good at the things that you enjoy doing, you know, I, I I'm not cut out to be a a five star A list Nashville session musician. I show up with a couple guitars. I sound the same on every one of them, and that's just kind of what it is. And I learned years ago that not not to fight it. You know, like don't go out and buy every pedal that your favorite guitar player has because he's already doing that better than anybody's going to be able to do ever. Mm. And so you got to kind of find out what you like, dig in, get good at it. And and you're going to be happy because that's going to send you down the right path to Mm -hmm. where you need to end up. And I also tell them like, look, you know, I didn't have any kind of, I quit school two weeks into the 10th grade, never went back, never learned any music uh, on paper. And, and, um, and so, you know, um, I, I had a I had a long term kind of like dream or vision or whatever kind of way out in there in, in the in the future, but I never had any hard fast goals like, okay, I'm going to move to Nashville and if things aren't working in three years, I'm going to move to L.A. and then if things aren't working there in two years, I'm moving to New York or I'm going to move into Paris or, or wherever. You just kind of got to stick around a little while, I think, and, yeah. and find out. And if it's really not working after a chunk of time, maybe reevaluate your situation. But, uh, you know, I just kind of, like I said, I kind of didn't have a, a hard, fast plan, but kind of saw out in the future kind of where I wanted to end up or some guys' careers that I thought would be kind of cool to emulate or, oh, this guy's doing five or six different things. That's really cool, you know. And then um, I just kind of, like I said, went where the good, went where the, I, I moved to a town where a lot of my heroes lived when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. And then, um, you know, went where the good, the good people and the good music and the work was, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. and, and, and that seemed to work, you know? <laughs> yeah. It seems like it. I mean, sure. there's a lot of shit that I wish I'd be doing. I mean, I, I wish, I wish that, um, you know, we all, we all look back and, you know, the hard thing about it is, is knowing that you, you know, and deep down that you have a lot of potential and a lot of natural ability or, or whatever we want to call that a gift or you worked harder when you were younger or whatever it was, your family was into a a lot of good music or wherever we come from. But then realizing that, you know, you haven't really, you're not really living up to the potential you really have. Today is nonstop. And suddenly your checking account is overdrawn. But what if we gave you more time on that one? At Huntington, if you accidentally overdraw your account by $50 or less, we've put a $50 safety zone in place so you won't be charged an overdraft fee. It's one more way we're looking out for you. (laughs) So you can have time for what matters most. Huntington, welcome. $50 Safety Zone does not apply to returned items. Your account will be automatically closed if it remains negative for 60 days. Learn more at Huntington.com slash safety zone. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more. Is that Shakespeare? Nope, it's Geico. Uh, Yeah, 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 that's Shakespeare from one of his unpublished works. Oh, it be not for awakening. Nay, give it thou the berries. For 15 minutes could save you 15% or more. No, it's from Geico, because they help save people money. Well, I hate to break it to you, but Geico got it from Shakespeare. Geico. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more. Yep. And that's something that, that's one of the only things that, you know, I wish I, was, I wish I would just, I just wish I wasn't so fucking lazy. <laughs> <laughs> there's, your, there's your nugget of advice. Well, I don't think it's held you, you know, back, but, man. But we're yeah. all hard on ourselves because we are our own worst critics because we do care about the music. We know that, we know that, that there's a lot more to learn. And if we sat around and just pat our, patted ourselves on the back all day long, t- telling ourselves how great we yeah. think we are, we'd suck. I think you, you said a lot, like especially these days where there's not a lot going on musically in clubs and stuff. It's, it's harder, but I think it's necessary to be around, kind of get your ass kicked musically a lot, yeah. especially when you're younger, man. If you yeah. can get in a spot where Nashville, L.A., mm-hmm. New York... I mean, I was doing that the last four years, you know, hanging with all these badasses, and and I would come back home, and my playing was better. Like yeah. I could tell, it just elevates you to something. You're never gonna get that watching YouTube. No, <laughs> you know? no, and and just playing with other people, playing you know? with other people, getting yeah. on a session, like getting in getting in the room with the the big dudes, you know, when you're young, and you yeah. know, you, all of a, that's like a stepping stone thing. And, you know? and having but, some of those guys yell at you, you know, and 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 kind of scare you to death.
so you're you're from not far from here, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And did you did you grow up playing a lot of live music in, in clubs? Yeah. Yep. Mardi Gras parades, clubs, festivals. Yeah. All kinds of stuff. I I was making money with a guitar since I was 11 years old. Yeah. And it's yeah. you can do you could do that. You can still do it. Not now, but I'm sure it'll come back. But mm -hmm. in South Louisiana, dude, there's festivals for there's there's a festival for festival season. There's festivals for strawberries, right? Catfish, yeah. Crawfish. I mean, you jazz festival. There's all kinds of stuff. So they people will come out and hear live music, even yeah. if it's shitty live music. They'll come out and so yeah. When I was a kid, absolutely, man. I yeah. was playing a lot, and that was. I I'm so glad I got to do that. You know. I'm yeah, kind of the same for me. You know, that was it. It was you know. I, I wish. A part of me, I've been spending more time in New Orleans lately than I ever have because of um, uh, this friend of mine that I connected with. And then, you know, having kind of a little bit of a network down here with through Doug. And I just met Kevin the other night and then I've known you for a while. And, you know, it's just uh, and I'm from this is kind of my latitude, you know, mm -hmm. um, I, I guess that's where is it latitude or longitude? I don't, I don't know. know. It's closer to the equator. Starboard. <laughs> but you know, I'm I'm from not too far from here and and it it feels good to be down here. It's a yeah. totally different thing. Nashville's squeaky clean and and uh, not to say it's less real cuz there's some great great shit going on there that you will only know if you're there for a while. Yeah. What Nashville's known for on TV and the radio to me is the you know, and trust me, I get it more than anybody. It's a business and people are making money, but it's the worst shit there as far as I'm concerned. Mm. But great musicians playing on those records, mm -hmm. but the writing and the art form to me is not anything that I'm interested in. Um, but if you go there and you get out and you meet people like Andy Reese and you see the time jumpers with Vince Gill and those guys, or you go see some stuff at Rudy's jazz club, there's even some great Cuban salsa music there with guys that are actually from mm -hmm. Cuba and Puerto Rico, uh, Puerto Rico and Venezuela. And there's some great music in Nashville, mm -hmm. but you got to be there and kind of know who to, sure. who to yeah. find, you know, who to talk to. It's like, I can't come to new Orleans and go to bourbon street. I got to hook yeah, up with you guys exactly. and have you take me to, you know, Frenchman street or the maple leaf or wherever to hear the real shit. But, but, um, you know, kind of the same boat as you grew up playing in clubs playing playing with my uncle and then playing with some bluegrass bands and songwriters and stuff and i think that's really that's really where it's at i can say i'm proud to say that every dime i've ever made since i was 12 years old kind of like you was from playing the guitar mm. you know and we're lifers man like you know there's not you you there the mentality now and especially f with five or six months of covid it really eliminates like we you know if you're not full of shit before you're really not going to be full, you know there's no room for bullshit now after this covid thing we've all it's just made us all kind of like you know you 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 realize what's really important you realize who your real friends are you realize who you know the shit you want to eliminate out of your out of your life it really brings everything right into focus and man, we're, you know, we're in this for, for, to me, the right reasons. We want to play music. It's not about the money we need. We need to make a living, but if you're getting paid a lot of money to play a gig that you're not happy with night after night, man, your days are numbered. You, it, eventually you're going to get out of that situation, no matter how much money it pays. Mm -hmm. Now I've never played with anybody like Bob Dylan or uh, or Tom Petty or any Bruce Springsteen, you know, now a gig like that might keep you yeah. around a little longer, but, <laughs> but that's also great music too. So, yeah, I don't know what I'm trying to say, but you, you get, you know, I understand. It's, you it's you kinda, can't just do it for money. Yeah. Yeah. We're, 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 I call them lifers, man. We're lifers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, bro. Uh, <laughs> Why don't we talk about, uh, I don't know. Let's see what else. Um, Okay, here's something you can you can you can use this to give like a little mini lesson if you want. What what's the most often asked request for you know when somebody hits you up on Skype or social media or whatever and say, man, I want to take a lesson like and you sit down. If you're gonna give somebody a ten minute lesson on what's the most the usual question you get is it chicken picking or is it like more technique or um, 
chord stuff or it's funny uh the the to answer your question the number one thing that that it seems people want to do is find out how to get out of the pentatonic box. How do I get out of the pentatonic trap or Hey man, I know all my chord shapes. I know all my scales. How do I make it sound like music? Right. That's the biggest number one question. And the number one answer for me, and I shouldn't even say this, but to me, it's that's the part that you can't really teach somebody, you know, you right. can, but that's the part that there is no magic pill for. It's like, cause there is like an interpersonal, almost spiritual aspect to music that I, I put it in that category. And then the other f category is the actual physical ability of putting both of your hands on the instrument and getting a good sound out of your right hand and your left hand and rhythm and timing and your tone and all those things. Those are just tools to be able to get to the other part which is forgetting about all that shit, putting that on autopilot subconscious, and then actually trying to make something that sounds like a, a melody or, or something that has a groove or hopefully both. Does that make sense? Yeah, I totally. Mean, yeah, is, it is hard. I, I know what you mean. And, and to, it's like hard you to said, make explain music, that. Well, that's a subjective thing. I mean, right. music to some people is well, exactly. music, but, but is it musical to other people? But, uh, yeah, but I, yeah, the, the pentatonic box, when I was teaching, that's that would get asked that a lot yeah because you, know, you get and then i would start saying well why you <laughs> why do you want to get out of piss I'm yeah. to get to, <laughs> everything's that's rock guitar right. I mean, that's kind of what people that's a lot right. of what you do oh and, and so the other thing that to, not to interrupt but the other thing they always ask is uh how to play over chord changes that might be the number one how to get out of the pentatonic box well, and how okay. to play so over chord changes. So if I was a student, just tell me real quick, what what would you what do you tell people? To, the first thing the, the first thing I say is is this is what changed my life because when I was learning a bunch of bluegrass flat picking tunes when I was a kid, uh, I was stuck trying to solo over G C and D chord on the first four or five frets of the guitar, open chords, right? And so some people call them cowboy chords or whatever, but just your open chords on the first three frets, and then. Uh, I wanted, I knew that I was trying to solo up the neck and I was getting completely lost, just mm -hmm. uh, completely lost. And so I watched this video uh, of a guy uh, and he said to, to be able to open up the fingerboard, you got to learn your chord shapes and learn the scales and arpeggios and stuff, the information around those chords. So like the caged what, forms. What or people whatever call, call the caged right. system now, which... I hate that something's called a system, but it, it actually really works to me yeah. because I know where my kind of home bases are. It helps my hand position. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it also helps you define the, the chord tones. Mm -hmm. And so I say, learn your, learn your chord inversions, the chords, the foundation, the arpeggios, the first level of framework, the pentatonics, the second level of framework. And then the scale is the third level of framework. Yeah. And so if you learn, and then also people, I had somebody the other day say, oh, yeah, I know the A pentatonic scale. That means I can use that over everything, right? <laughs> I just right. I went, well, no, not really. And so then I'll say, look, like, um, okay, there's four four different sounds that you need to kind of get get to where you can start discerning, right? Uh, say you're in the key of C. You need to look at C major, right. C major 7, C dominant 7, and C minor. Mm -hmm. And then you really need to be able to know the difference between targeting those chord tones to play over those changes. So I would say if I'm playing something like this, right, which is a, a E major, A flat dominant seven, the three, C sharp minor seven, the six, E seven, to A, to B, or B7, and then back to the one, E. So if I was going to say how to outline those chords, well, you could play this. You know, you could play very simply, melodically over that chord change and still technically be playing over the chords. Like if I just played this. So you're, I'm just playing that 
you know, two or three or four notes around the, the C-shaped E chord pentatonic, mm -hmm. but I'm still targeting, you know, that becomes the flat seven of your three chord and then so forth. Or I would say to take it to the next, uh, you know, chapter, I would say outline your one, three, triad. Uh, maybe your one, three triad. And so yeah. that would be, uh, that would be first this. And then I'd say maybe add the next note to it, like the octave. So I go. So as soon as I I hit the flat seven, you know immediately that's a yeah, dominant you're, you're seven chord. The, the chord, the strong chord. Tone. Yeah. So it would sound like. Uh, No extra charge for mistakes, but yes, Shane, so. Shane, of course, knows all this in spades. But that, to me, that's that's kind of like for for me, it's kind of visualizing those chord shapes, and that kind of helps me get it under my fingers mm -hmm. and just seeing like okay, and none of that was perfect by any means, but you get the idea, you know. Going and then people will go, well, how come that three chord's not a minor? It has to be a minor, and I go, well, it's not because it's leading you to the yeah to the uh six minor yeah so it's all about the so it's the the major third the flat seven the one how those lead because if you play over a five chord this is my hillbilly way of thinking about it the, if you play over the five chord the dominant seven or the the flat seven of the five chord is leading to it's pulling your ear to the major third of the one chord it's a half step away. Tension and release. The tension and release. Mm -hmm. So that that pulls your ear to those other chords. So in order to, to in order to play over chord changes, to me, you have to be targeting the chord tones. That's great advice. Yeah. So, it how do you like the, how do you look at that, Shane? No, I look at it the same way, actually. Chord tones. <clears throat> same thing. Same thing. Really? I mean, then you know, then you get a little more like I, I use that approach for years and years and years and still do depending on the, the chord progression I'm trying to navigate. But then I watched an inter interview with Matheny, Pat mm -hmm. Matheny and, and Pat was basically said, yeah, at this point, it's just 12 notes to me. I just, I right. just think 12 notes. Yeah. So it's like a wider swath of right harmonic stuff to navigate, but it's kind right. of the same thing because your ear will pull you. But yeah, it's good to like what Guthrie's talking about is great advice. And it's like more stepping stone, mm -hmm. knowing where you can land and you can craft melodies around those safe notes. You know? Yeah. I love the way like that progression actually reminds me like something Willie Nelson would do, you know, and Willie <laughs> is actually 
can be quite raggedy uh, guitar, but he plays it's some quite brilliant beautiful shit. Beautiful, yeah. At the yeah, same time, I agree, man. And his thing is really uh, from that school of thought, chord mm -hmm. tones. You know, he'll he'll go uh, like if I was if Willie was gonna. You know, yeah, he'll, he'll yeah, do yeah, that yeah. kind of thing. Right. Right. <laughs> That's it's it. Chord tones. He'll land on a. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, That's it. And, yeah. And it pulls your ear like Guthrie was saying. You're, you're. You're going, oh, that's, oh, and it resolves. Mm -hmm. And there's a moment of tension right. and release. Right. And tension and release, you know. Yeah. It's jazz, you know, man. Yeah. Will, Willie, the people may or may not know this, but one of, like, his favorite guitar players, Django. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah absolutely. You, you know, and, and you don't want it to start sounding like a uh, an arpeggio exercise. Mm -hmm. But I think that, you know, a lot of times I'll go up a full arpeggio and then down the scale. Uh -huh. And so not on not really on purpose, but my ear just, you know, it nothing outlines the chord quicker to me than one of those arpeggios. Yeah. Like I said, you don't want it to start sounding like you're arpeggiating every chord because it's going to start sounding like an exercise. But in a split second, if somebody played this. Anywhere in the world, you know that's an A flat dominant seven right. arpeggio. It can't really be anything else. I mean, it probably can, but you know. So I'll go like over that chord, and then right there. Yeah. Oh, you know, going yeah, right. so. Uh, sure. uh, and then you're. Nice bends you're doing too are really nice. Yeah. But uh yeah. And since I haven't taken the time to to really learn what I'm doing on this guitar, that that's well, that's as far as I, that's as far as I've taken it is using those chord shapes. But you know, I hear these guys like Schofield and Shane on your I mean your solo records are some of my favorite stuff. I mean, playing and tone wise and groove and everything but i mean the, the you know playing outside as people call it playing outside and knowing where you're at and being able to that's where it gets into like if, i hate the term next level but that's that's really the next level and that's where i want to i, I want to start exploring how to get out of of what you know i've been doing for the past 20 years and and get to the next chapter where i can start looking at it more like the 12 right. notes and not just bound by the chord shapes because it is a, it is a whole different thing. And I know, you know, that, you know, it is a different thing. I, I'm not definitely not a, you know, I'm not saying I can do it. ask you a question so if 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 you are to the point like where i'm at where okay you know i i, I can navigate around uh, a few things but 
I'm not a jazz player by any stretch of the word, and people think I am because I they they hear the flavor of it, and they don't really realize that I don't know the harmony and the chord structure and that kind of thing. I can quote unquote fake it, right? Which I hate to even say that. That's but you do know it, and if if you were me, what what are the things that you start incorporating or start learning to be able to get into that next kind of chapter well, I don't, of I don't know if I'm a jazz player either I can play jazz things but you know I don't um I've played with with a lot of jazz players that only do jazz mm -hmm. I, I don't know I would I don't know exactly what you'd be is it is it taking is it just keep is it is it is it getting just more and more you know your your chord vocabulary well I think expanding it's, uh, that yeah, maybe. I don't know, bro. <laughs> I mean, I think it's probably like phrasing and, and mm -hmm. um, you know, that whole thing. I mean, there's a whole new language. It seems to me, I could be wrong, but like in New York, mm -hmm. you know, like the newer guys who's that's not new anymore was Kurt Rosenwinkel. And right. he created this thing and it spawned all these new guys. So in New York, there's like... You know, they're playing. What was he doing differently? I think it was phrasing and it was uh, like his, uh, he would do a lot of things like triplets. And I never learned any of his stuff, but he's a brilliant player. But um, yeah, I think some of the, uh, well, to, to sort of extrapolate on what you were saying earlier about, uh, yeah, that's a good word, extrapolate. Yeah, that's a good one. That's a hell of a one. I'm gonna get, <laughs> get out your Wikipedia, folks. <laughs> yeah. uh, <laughs> uh, no, you were talking about learning like cage thing, just to get mm -hmm. back to that. One thing I did see with him, that was very helpful to me, but I had already been, been kind of doing it. Like I used to have students that say, oh yeah, I know all my major scales. Yeah, right. I know I, I know the caged. Yeah, right. I know what else you got? And mm -hmm. I'll go, okay, so let me see you stay in in uh, third position on guitar, mm -hmm. your index finger on the third fret, your pinky on the sixth fret. Mm -hmm. Let me see you play all 12 keys, major right. scales. Right. All 12 keys. Yeah. I put the metronome on, you know. 80 BPM or something. Right. Let me let me see it. And they're oh well, they have to fumble around totally and yeah. move around. No, so mm -hmm. you don't really know you don't it. really know it right. because guitar right. can be a bitch to learn. It, it's very difficult to sight read on because mm -hmm. we have so many positions possibilities and so many things repeating. Yeah, yeah, like you you can play this C music. right, and that is all the same middle ledger line c right. on, a, on a staff music manuscript paper on a piano there's one way to play right. that note right. 88 keys there's one it's of those one of them yeah yeah we have like five mm -hmm. exactly. so that opens up a whole can of worms and then it also applies to major scales like you're you like you're saying so i mean this this is to kind of answer your question about jazz harmony i think playing over chord changes after a while on guitar, you want to get out of patterns on guitar. Like, mm -hmm. and the way to do that, it would, I used to practice scales like this. So it can't, obviously you can't see this on, if you're listening, but I would take this G major scale and I would practice right horizontally. Exactly. It, but then not just that, I would, I'd put a metronome on and I would just do random shit. Like I would go, I write down like, six keys mm -hmm. okay let's say g b flat d just a flat mm -hmm. i don't fucking remember <laughs> g so i would start my g now what did i say um b flat now i'm in b flat d flat now i'm in d flat um i forget the other ones i'd say but you just i'm moving up the neck mm -hmm. switching right in midstream yeah. to a new position. I'm not pr playing the scale up and down. Oh, next one. No, mm -hmm. that's not how it works in real life. When right. you're navigating right. a chord change. Yeah. You, you, you might have a melodic idea that you want, you're hearing and you want to play, which is the absolute goal of jazz right. improvisation. As far mm -hmm. as I can tell, totally. Yeah. To be able to express your ideas spontaneously and not be, inhibited by a chord change mm -hmm. so if that chord is gone something right. weird i don't know yeah like, would never do that but you you want to be able to shift your your idea without having to think about stupid ass position changes right so yeah. i mean that would be how you get to the next thing with phrasing I've, I've seen cats do it and i do a little bit of it myself but that and that will definitely help your ear absolutely because having to go from hearing that 
that root of G and then switching midstream to B flat yeah. and switching to that. I mean, let's see if I can do it. I mean, that's some pretty. Like, like I'll just, I'll, I'm not, I'm not want to take up all your time. But that's a hell of an exercise. Yeah, it is a really good exercise. I practice it a lot. So let's say I'm going to keep it simple just for this. Let's say A, F sharp, and D. Okay. You I'm want me put... to hold that up to the mic? Sure. Uh, yeah. So I can't do it. I'll embarrass myself. But like, okay, A, F sharp. So I'm going to start here. That's my A down fifth position, mm -hmm. whatever. So, okay, A, F sharp, and uh, D. So A, all right, let me hear it. So I'm going to keep it really simple, eighth notes. Now, F sharp, D, see how I, A, F sharp, D. See, it's like a little game you can wow. play. Wow, that's awesome. Kind of, yeah, yeah. So if you practice that enough, then you're you can play. Uh, that's a thirty-eight old measure. <laughs> <laughs> it still. Worked. I couldn't find the off switch. I, I bought this when I was at GIT in like wow. the early '90s at the store. It was the cheapest one they had because that's all I could afford. And the guy goes, "Well." You could buy this other one. It's a lot better. And I go, yeah, but it's 20 bucks. I'll take the $8 one. He goes, awesome. it might last you the rest of the year. but uh, <laughs> It's <laughs> lasted 30 years. <laughs> that's anyway. awesome. Uh, now, that's a great exercise because, yeah, when, when you're, you know, and I'm one to talk because I'm the, I'll am the be the first one to get lost. But if you are thrown some chord changes that are that are out of your comfort zone, you're 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 screwed. Yeah. You know. Now, in the real world of, you know, quote working stuff that you would actually get paid for that you you know commercial mm -hmm. music or whatever session or nashville mm -hmm. you're you know people will know, how would you use that but it's still useful like if oh, you're, totally. you know you're crafting a part or you're coming up with a hook or whatever you, it's you got to know where you're you're gone yeah. you got to know your chord well tone. and 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 for me especially if i'm playing like the mandolin or something which i do frequently uh you know, you get some guy and you're on a session all day long and every song that he's singing that he wrote is in E flat, A flat, B flat. Yeah, I mean, you know, they're like every I've been on sessions before where every song the guy wrote were all in flat keys. Mm. And and yeah, you got to you got to know how to play in flat keys, you mm -hmm. know, and it can get like if people are practicing in their bedroom for 15 years and they only play in G, A and E and E then yeah you get thrown another key and you're going to be That's it's going to be challenging capos for. yeah <laughs> the hillbilly crutch oddly you know oddly free right yeah Aud oddly told me this story he was on on my podcast too. he told me this story that he was on this this one of these gigs uh house band type things and mm -hmm. keith richards was a special guest so they were backstage working on a tune mm -hmm. and oddly had a capo on and keith was i, I don't know man it sounds like keith might have been like kind of need a little, him bit. Up a little bit but it was hilarious he he's looking he goes well, how are you how are you hearing how are you playing the and he all he goes well keith i mean i just have it on the third fret i'm playing up here like i'm just you know and this is gonna be my d and it goes with you you well, that's an a and he's, yeah but you're you know i'm capoed up so i was like I, and i'm tuned down or something right and then it went on and on he was trying to explain it and then keith finally got it and he goes brilliant <laughs> Not even the bloody Germans could figure this out. <laughs> <laughs> that That's awesome, man. Oh, God. Uh, I used to do, I did a few records with this blues singer named Bobby Rush, and he called it a cheater. He's like, hey, Shane, let me hold you, cheater. <laughs> cheater. <laughs> That's awesome, man. And then you got somebody like Albert Collins that never took it off, oh, right? Oh, no, man. It's like, it had that, I, I guess. I wonder if it had anything to do with the fact that, like, you know how B B is, like, just a really resonant key? Mm -hmm. I don't know why, but it seems like, you know, right in here, that that chord just sounds good in that part of the guitar. I wonder if he felt that and just said, I'm moving everything to that. You know, like, if you have an acoustic and you capo up on the fourth yeah. fret or something, it gets real, the string tension yeah. gets tighter and yeah. it just gets fun to play. I don't know.
right. Since so tell me about it. your school. Is it uh, what's it called, and how can people find it? And... Yeah. So uh, um, I'll give you the whole end of the end of the podcast spiel. Yeah, so um, do it. yeah, if you want to if you want to check out any music or merch or the lessons or anything like that, you can of course go to GuthrieTrap dot com, and um, I've got my uh, private Skype and Zoom lessons on there. And I can uh, I, I can do in person lessons in Nashville, but I've, I've, since COVID, I've just kind of been going to the Skype and Zoom stuff. And then the the really good one, the the best bang for your buck, and the real like professionally recorded and shot with uh, pro audio and video is this company called Artist Works, and that's ArtistWorks.com. And there's like 35 uh, teachers on there, and it's um, I have the country electric guitar school. But it's not limited to that. It's right. basically just, you know, all the concepts we've been talking about, how to kind yeah. of start playing over chord changes and stuff like that. And and it's a really good company. They're they're like the pinnacle of online learning. You can do video exchanges where you've got you've got access to my full curriculum that we that we recorded, but you also have the option of sending in a video of your progress or with any questions, and then I get that in my queue and I respond with a video. So it's video exchange learning. And um, it's a great it's a great school, man. The the owners and and all the people that work there are friends of mine. I've been out to Napa, California, and videoed with them a bunch of times. And and uh, they've got teachers like John Patitucci, Nathan East, uh, Paul Gilbert, Brian Sutton, uh, Keith Wyatt does the blues course. I mean, they've got classical jazz, bluegrass, all kinds of different stuff. So really great school. Uh, so there's that. Check that out, and you know, follow my uh, Instagram and Facebook and all that stuff that now we have got to some, do. I've got one of your records, Pick Peace. Yeah, I did a couple records. I, yeah. I, I'd like to. I think I'd like to come, maybe like to come down here to New Orleans and do another one, do a third one down here. Yeah. But um, yeah, there's a couple records floating around out there. I'm gonna and, play some things in the, you know. I'm oh. Inter- okay, cool. Put a couple yeah, yeah. Things in there. And I got a, the latest one that I did. It was a couple years ago, but there's the first one's all instrumental, kind of a little kind of sort of stripped down. And then the second one I did has a bunch of guest singers on there. Vince Gill's on there, Jimmy Hall, uh, the McCrary sisters, Becca Bramlett. Wow. Uh, so there's a bunch, good of, was bunch of good singers on there. Yeah, and a <laughs> bunch of different musicians on that one, too. And a lot of different kinds of music. I played some acoustic guitar, electric guitar. Some of those songs on there are i'm pretty proud of um and then uh the first one was my first record so it kind of f- sounds like a a first record <laughs> oh man sometimes I'm trying first to, records are the best i'm always yeah. trying to figure my shit out but but uh yeah thanks a million shane for having me on here man absolutely bro really great great to yeah. see your studio and and man shane's one of my favorite guitar players and and proud to be able to call him a friend of mine Oh, uh, likewise man yeah thanks, thanks man so all right thanks for tuning in Later. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thanks for checking that out. Yeah, we, it could have went on and on, as as is the case usually here on the Riff Raff. A lot of other jams happen after that, some of which may see the light of day at some point on my website. Um, yeah, hit me up, Instagram, Facebook. Check out ShaneTerrio.com. Thank you for listening. Next time. This year has reminded us of the importance of saving for the unexpected. And as a bank, our job is to make that a little easier for everyone. That's why at Huntington, we're so proud to introduce Money Scout. It analyzes your checking account to find money that's not being used and moves it to your savings automatically. It's that simple. So you can always be saving, even now. 
Learn more and enroll at Huntington.com slash Money Scout. Huntington. Welcome. Money Scout is subject to eligibility, terms and conditions, and other account agreements. Member FDIC.